wide around the fireside And we'll soon make room for you Let your heart have no fear There are no strangers here Just friends that you never knew How are you all doing over on the common ground on the hill? Coming to you from Restrever at the moment the place is full of poetry written all over the place when you mature, come and visit me. I will be on the swing. Well, you know, I have to go up to the house very soon to meet Walt Michael, a great friend of mine from Common Ground on the Hill. Uh, we're doing a, a little Zoom thing after a while. Was it home for a knockdown? But before I go into the house, I was thinking, uh, just to show you around a little bit, because... You know, when you're standing on a stage, people only see the singer. And, uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of choice for a challenging look at me all the time. But I just walk up to the top of this hill here. So I like coming up to this hill because the high place is good. Get to the high place. And uh, what I like to do. This meadow here, Dickens walked in this meadow. Uh, Narnia was conceived, more or less. Uh, a man called C.S. Lewis used to come down here to Restrever on his holidays. And he was staying in a place called the Great Northern Hotel, which is just right beside where I live. And I'll be going over there in a minute or two. Uh, the hotel, that's it there in the photograph. It's blown up during the Troubles. Indeed, a few slates come off our house at the same time. But uh, all is well, thankfully. But whenever Lewis looked out through the window here, and this is the sight you will see here, actually. C.S. Lewis looked out through a window just a few yards from here and said, that part of Rostrever which overlooks Carlingford Loch is my idea of Narnia. Under a particular light, at any moment, a giant might raise his head over the next ridge. He's right, you know. The most famous giant of them all, Finn McCool, is resting on top of the Cooley Mountains over there, just waiting on the sun to lift a few clouds, and you could see him at any moment. Local man, John Joe Parr, a very good friend of mine, put it in his own poetic way, in a more familiar way. I see Finn is smoking his pipe this morning, is what he would say. Well, while we await the appearance of Finn, I think now that we have a bit of time on our hands, I'll tell you a story. Once upon a time, a long time ago, or oh, before your time, and even before my time, when people had time to tell a story and to listen to one, there lived a man called Finn McCool. He's lying over on that mountain and he's got plenty of time now. In fact, he's only a stone's throw away from here. That's him over there. This is a stone that he threw. But that's another story entirely. But during the time that I'm talking about, when people had time, and Finn had been out hunting with his men and his women, and he was sitting in the forest having a bite to eat, in between bites, he asked them all, he said, what's the most beautiful music in the world? Well, one said, maybe the cuckoo in spring. Yeah, not too bad. Anybody else? The sound of a young girl laughing. Hmm. Eventually, between two very big bites, they knew they had to ask him. Wise man, Finn, what do you think is the most beautiful music in the world? And Finn looked out into the middle distance and he said, the most beautiful music in the world is the music of what happens.
There is a little morning all in the month of May, and by a flowery garden I careless lead it stray, and there a lovely damsel did appear all in my view. By her charm she was entitled the maid of Balladu. Well, I gently walked up to her, and this to her did say, Would you be lovely, Ellen, our Flora, Queen of May? I'm only a poor young country girl, and that you know is true. And the title that they give to me is a maid of Balladu. I learned that song from a one-armed postman called Charlie Fagan uh, at home. And Charlie used to be able to ride the bicycle and take out a cigarette and a box of matches and light the cigarette whilst on the bicycle. That is his main claim to fame, apart from the maid of Balladu. But in saying hello to you, I, I want to sing you a song. I'm going over to these. Uh, there are a bunch of... Well, Four Thrones is part of the Narnia story. And I'll, I'll sing you that song. Come gather good friends, come gather and you Not like the way they all used to do With a hug or a handshake, a cuddle or two But on Skype or on Zoom and a meter or two Between me and you, between me and you The future is resting between me and you Sickness and sorrow steals a good friend Hunger and poverty hides round the band A time to be needing a friendship that's true The future is resting between me and you Between me and you, between me and you The future is resting between me and you Times are strange, but we must find a way To lift up our hearts and to face a new day There's jokes and cartoons to lighten the strain To go a bit mad or we'd all go insane Between me and you, between me and you The future is resting between me and you At last there's a barber to get my hair cut It's twenty-five pounds, the price has gone up How much for a shave? Just seven, he said All right, says I, just shave my head <laughs> His answer was no, and I thought with a smile I suppose it just grows in you after a while Between me and you, between me and you the future is resting between me and you So hard for to know just what to believe There's news that is true and there's news to deceive But I'll wash my two hands when I come and I leave And I'll still wear a mask and sneeze in my sleeve Between me and you, between me and you The future is resting between between me and you Good God of Almighty forgives all the time Humans forgive just some of the time Nature forgives but never forgets It takes what we give and it gives what it gets Between me and you, between me and you The future is resting between me and you So good friends and companions, be safe and be true Friendship and love is the best we can do The virus of hatred has not gone away We all need each other to show us the way Between me and you, between me and you The future is resting between me and you Between me and you, between me and you The future is resting between me and you. Yes, oh, sorry. I was talking about a monument over here. 
That's a monument to a man called Captain Ross. And uh, many stories about him. He's a, a British general. And many generals got land around here as payment for their work with the British Empire and so on. In 1814, General Ross burnt the White House, would you believe? That was during the uh, American War of Independence, or a certain part of it. And uh, that monument is to him because he lived here and they actually owned the house that I live in. Well, I live in the stable and uh, we got it sorted out and cleaned up a bit. And that's where I will be going back now in a minute or two to Zoom with Walt Michael. But as I go over, I'll, because uh, I'm going into the room and it's a bit dark in there, it's a little bit of an attic and I won't be able to see you very clearly. But I'll, I'll uh, sing you a song or two. This is a song actually. It's a song I wrote a little while back, uh, prompted by many American friends. Uh, and we were looking at the idea of the American dream. And, you know, some people see the American dream as making a billion dollars. Other people see it as making a living. And uh, I'm going to sing it to you. And it's, it's on a recording I have here. It's on a new album I did called Fair Play to You All. It's called American Dreams. And by the time that's over, I'll be in the house and Walt Michael will be on the other side of the line.
Well, welcome, folks. Welcome to the Common Ground on the Hill concert series. And yes, indeed, we are virtual. So we're not quite sure where you're coming from, but we know where we're coming from today. We're coming from Westminster, Maryland, and Belfast, County Down, Northern Ireland, with the amazing and wonderful poet, songwriter, and uh, activist Tommy Sands. Uh, Tommy comes from an amazing musical family um, in Northern Ireland, where he grew up playing music, listening to the music of uh, his farmer neighbors, who were both Catholic and Protestant. And from that experience, uh, we get this amazing peacemaker whose songs have circled the planet. And uh, we're just so lucky to have him with us for this concert. There'll be an interview in the middle of the concert. And we strongly encourage you to, uh, to uh, donate to the tip jar so that Tommy can continue his work as a musician during this pandemic. And also uh, encourage you to uh, purchase his music and his wonderful book, which has uh, some pretty amazing reviews. So we welcome to our virtual stage, Tommy Sands. Well, Tommy, it's so great to have you here uh, in, in my home and uh, in everyone's home. <laughs> Thank you, Walter, and vice versa. There's a little hereness and every thereness and a, a thereness and every hereness these days, and it, it's something good about it. Yeah, it's interesting. So, how has the uh, pandemic played out with you and playing music? Are you able to play in person at places, or is this no, no? I, I haven't. In fact, my last public concert I think was in March, and. Uh, I've I've done very few uh, concerts, even online, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I, and uh, it's it's a strange time, but it gives gives us a new way of seeing the world. Uh, I yeah. go out walking a lot, and uh, I hear birds singing more clearly than they sang before. Maybe with the less pollution pollution in the air, or whatever. It's a I suppose it's a bit of a curse and a, a blessing as well because we can see things in a different way absolutely you know i was i was um thinking about your music and i was reading more about your family and i i read that your father was a fiddler and yes an accordion player that's that right led me to um thinking about how songwriters are influenced and to, for my money, the best of songwriters are ones who are informed by tradition and um, also a melody of the great tunes. And I, I'm assuming that's sort of what was happening in your household. What was it like to be a kid in that situation? Well, for me, it's very, uh, looking back, it is very important for my, for my growing up and for the rest of my life as well. Uh, in fact, and in fact, I've got a little, before they died, I got a, an old camera and I took a, a little uh, shot of them singing a song. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I've got it here, uh, if we can put it on. As I was gone to Newry, riding on a cloud, it's there I met me darling on the mountain high. By brood besoms, by them where they're new. Fine how they're besoms, that they're never good. If you want a besom for to sweep your house, come to me if buy ya, you can have your choice. Buy broom besoms, buy them where they're new. Fine how they're besoms, that they're never good. If I had a donkey, I could have a cart. If I had a wife, she would take me part. Buy broom besoms, buy them for their new. Fine have their besoms, that they never grew. If you want to buy them, I'll pay them on your back. All the yarn is toppings, lasses would you smack. Buy broom besoms. Never grew. If she takes a bottle, that's all right with me. 
If she doesn't touch it, all the more for me. Fine rubies, by the northern year. Fine heather reasons, but they're never new. Great. Yeah, that, that, that was, that is my father and mother uh, doing a song called As I Was Going to Newry Riding on a Plow. Uh -huh. And it is one of the first tunes that he played that he would teach us to play on the fiddle. And it is sort of a, a dance went along with it. And uh, I think my very earliest memory while well, it was growing up and going to bed early at night because I was too young to stay up. <laughs> but listening to the sound of the fiddle leaking underneath the bedroom door, accompanied by the flicker of a Nile lamp. And uh, I thought it more sinful to be asleep than to be awake whenever the neighbours come in with fiddles under their arms and black bottles squeaking in their inside pockets. And uh, it, is, it is very important uh, because the, the tunes I played were both Protestant and Catholic tunes because they're all the same anyway. Right. And uh, because they were both Protestant and Catholic neighbours came in. And my earliest memory when I joined the session as a child was uh, just watching toes tapping to the same rhythm, regardless mm. of the political persuasion or religious affiliation, and realize that music was something that could somehow connect up all the secret and the sacred things inside us without our knowing. And that, that affected me, I think, for the rest of my life. Well, yeah, that's powerful stuff. Um, and, and how many uh, siblings did you have, or do you have? Uh, there were seven in the family, uh, five boys and two girls. <laughs> And uh, but we all played music. Uh, I suppose we were playing at home, of course, with our parents and with neighbours and uh, picking up the traditional songs from our neighbours. And uh, there were a lot of uh, songs which, even though they were very old, they meant very important and they never seemed to lose relevance. I remember the one song my father sang was a, an immigration song, Immigration Going to America. It's called uh, Lovely Irish Maid. And uh, of course, it is sung unaccompanied. Went mm. something like, uh, As I went out a walking down by a riverside, I heard a maid complaining as the tears rolled from her eyes. I heard a maid complaining, and as to me she said, I'll oh, stay at home and do not wrong from your lovely Irish maid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even today, when I look out through the window here and I see a little pier where people left for America, I, those songs still mean an awful lot to me. And those were days when people left, that was it, they left, and, and you knew that you exactly. could see them again. Exactly. Yeah, because I have a, an ancestor who, um, I have a poem written by my great-grandmother's brother, who went to be a wagon, a wagoneer sort of scout and facilitator heading west, and, um, he, he mentioned in the poem that he would he knew he'd never see his sister again. That wasn't that long ago, really, that when, when people traveled, that was it. So, uh, you know, that could create a song for you. <laughs> Absolutely. And you, your people came from uh, uh, close to here, what was it? Um, I have people that um, came from, from northern, that's right, northern Ireland. Uh, northern Ireland. They were South Ireland, right? I, no, no um, my musical partner, Tom... Tom McCreesh had oh, yes, yes. from Armagh, right? Yes, but, yes. But uh, we were, well, I'm I'm quite a mongrel, uh, Cornwall, yeah, yeah. Cornwall, and uh, and England and uh, Northern Ireland. Yeah. Yes, yes, great, great. Oh. The more, the merrier. That's right. 
Who yeah, are yeah. the people anyway? Yes. Tom, Tommy, I wanted to speak briefly about the, when we met, which was in 1981, I think it was May of 1981, on the Belfast Festival bus. And you were singing, my group was playing, and we were adorned by the um, Miss Belfast uh, contestants who were in uh, bathing suits and uh, man tan. They were all tanned up, and it was about 40 degrees out. <laughs> but I remember seeing you there, and uh, this was, uh, for people who don't know about the history, this is a time when Belfast was just sort of maybe emerging from the troubles and um, and the city was on basically on lockdown. You had to go through tight security just to get into the city. And there we were perched atop a bus um, singing songs of peace. Yes. And I remember that well. Yeah. It is a, it is a, a bad time. It is a, yeah. There's a lot of people who've been killed at that time. Yes. So, so you and I spoke when you were here at Common Ground on the Hill a couple of summers ago about what's going on now. What, what do you see as sort of the future of Northern Ireland? We know that there was a great influx of, uh, of business back during the Clinton administration, and Ireland became just so much more, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word wealthy, but you know, things did happen and people were employed. Um, what is the scene now, and what do you see as the future of Northern Ireland? Well, the first thing I would say, things are so much better now than they were then, uh, because the uh, people, uh, politicians, have great difficulty in coming together. Often they do. Politicians have more worries about their opponents and their, uh, or rather they're worried about their supporters more than their opponents. And, uh, but the Good Friday Agreement was very important uh, happening and that at least there are thousands of people alive today who would may well have not have been alive if the killings had continued. And uh, I suppose one of the memories that I have of it, and I often think about it, you know, often we elect politicians and ask them to get on with it instead of being there all the time uh, to make sure that you get on with properly. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes the loudest voices from the side dictate what the politician will do. And that silent majority don't have a voice. And I remember leading up to the, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, the, the, the week off the, before they went into the talks, everybody, every news uh, TV station was interviewing the politicians. But whenever they were in the talks, they were interviewing everyone who disagreed with the politicians. Because the nature of television is, it can't, TV can't deal with peace very well. Right. If you put a cam, see in a blue sky and a screen and hold that shot for more than five seconds, people will be getting their remote control searching for storms because television is about moving pictures. Yeah. Uh, so the big blockbuster movies are about burnings, wars. So what we decided to uh, create a storm for that six o'clock news during the Good Friday Agreement. And uh, I remember I went along with this man called Vedran Smilovic, who is a cello player in Sarajevo. In fact, you may have heard of him. He, was, he played during the siege. And during that time, a CNN reporter ran out with a, he played the cello. He was a classical musician. And the TV camera man said, are you not crazy for playing your cello while they shell Sarajevo? And Smilovic looked at him and he says, you ask me if I'm crazy for playing my cello while they shell Sarajevo. Why don't you ask them, are they not crazy for shelling Sarajevo while I play the cello? But he came over here and he stayed here in this room. And uh, we went to Stormont to where the politicians were because we felt that they needed support in the talk. And the, the, there was a danger of the talks breaking down completely. And uh, I wanted to create a chorus that 
people could agree on to sing. Because if you invite rival politicians onto television together, and if they don't fight with each other, they won't be invited back together on television. Because television needs that action. So I, I wrote a song the night before, and uh, with just a very simple thing, I knew we would get maybe a few seconds on the six o'clock news. But I just simply said, keep going. Carry on, carry on. You can hear the people singing. Carry on, carry on. The peace will come again. And the TV news carried a lot of it. And actually, you can see there's a little video clip here of uh, some of the, the paramilitaries out there singing the song. Because the chorus of a song, you can sing it without losing face. And you can sing it together publicly without losing face. So very seldom do politicians get the opportunity to publicly agree with each other. Because someone's going to be saying, you're compromising. So uh, I'll play you a little bit of that now. Great, great. Informed by a, a, a little boy listening through the, through the closed door of, uh, to the music played by uh, Protestant and Catholic farmers. Yeah. Well, let's hear that song. Okay.
I had a, uh, a similar experience, of course, not, not nearly as important. Um, but uh, every year I play an event uh, for an organization uh, that's actually part of our local government uh, that looks into cases of discrimination and, and there's a dinner every evening, uh, once a year. And they asked me to come and sing and I, I talk about Common Ground on the Hill, and et cetera. And um, I generally sing, We Shall Overcome. Yeah. And in this specific uh, uh, evening, there were local politicians whom I knew probably had never sung that song or maybe saw it on the news and uh, it, it uh, was not having any effect or that they would shy away from it. And so I started singing it and one by one people stood in the, in this, you know, at this gathering. And then there it was, the, the local politicians were standing and singing, we shall overcome. And I thought, you know, I don't know if this is going to amount to anything, but I'm gonna bet that them being given that opportunity to be part of that through song um, there'd have to be a feeling there and maybe, maybe a change. And, uh, so, you know, the power of music to do these things, I think is, uh, we should never forget how important that is. I think you're right, Walt. I think inside everybody, there are all these positive things and negative things, and it depends what you bring to the surface, uh, what becomes evident and a song in a proper context can do that, I think. Yeah. Sure. And that's what your life has been, doing these songs. I read about your work in Nevada in the prison system, uh, uh, helping prisoners write songs uh, to present as their defense uh, when they went to trial. Yes. I, I was hoping... I work a little bit in prisons over here I remember being up in uh, in Reno, and uh, the, the kids. Uh, one thing that turned them on was uh, this particular what this particular place I was. It was, a, it was a youth prison, but the people had changed in the rankles, and this kid is as young as eleven there, yeah. and uh, but the one the most important thing to them wasn't. I, God or wasn't a, whatever. It is a judge. Because the judge was going to decide if they should go to an adult prison when they became 19. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that they could express so much through songs. Uh, a lot of rap songs, but the saying, they knew what they were talking about. They were feeling it in some way. So I, I, I met up with the, the judge in the area, a woman called Frances Doherty, who's a great woman. And uh, she had connections with music herself. And uh, I, I, I thought about the idea if they, if they could sing a song to her. Uh, and she said, well, very often, they don't tell me what's inside their heart at all. And it's very difficult to make decisions. So she said, she understood that sometimes words on their own can reach to the ends of the earth, but words in the wings of a song can soar higher and seek deeper and reach further inside to express hurt or pain. And she said, if you can get them to write a song, I'll accept that. And uh, there was one song. Song by, written. They didn't know how to write songs. I hardly knew myself how to write a song. I've been writing songs for years, but I never really taught anyone how to write a song. But I was forced into thinking about it. And I thought there should be, well, they helped me a lot. The kids helped me. A song about their life, the three verses. First about the past, second about the present, third about the future. Mm -hmm. And they went through each line, four lines in each verse. First line, where were you born? Second line, what was it like? Third line, what is your family like? And fourth line, would you like to go back there? And 
I mean, through all the verses. And they said, don't worry about rhyming any of these answers. Just, we can rhyme that. That's easy. Uh, just write a sentence uh, to answer those questions. And some beautiful songs came up. And I remember that uh, we had to find uh, a similar melody that everybody would know. And uh, I thought about who's popular in America. I thought Elvis Presley. You'll know Elvis Presley. <laughs> oh, that's a, they never had heard of Elvis Presley. Most of them never heard of him. The only melody they all knew in common was Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And their lives, their culture lives had ended very young. And this is one. I don't know whether you can hear me or not. I was born in Stamford on the bay. Seems so long now, so far away. There were pretty flowers all around. They grew up, but I grew down. Will you hear me? Will you hear me? Stanford on the bay seems so long now, so far away. There were pretty flowers all around. They grew up, I grew down. Will you hear me? Will you hear me? They grew up, but I grew down. That's yes. a great line. Incredible, isn't it, Walt? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's the job of the bard, I think, to get people to, um, to, to listen, to listen to their interior selves and maybe find a way to, to express it. We all have that capability, but we live in a time where we're just receiving, receiving, receiving. And um, that's why we do Common Ground on the Hill, to teach people how to be expressive, to harness that within them. I must say that Common Ground on the Hill I, I was lucky enough to be invited and to be there. Very, very impressive. I learned an awful lot there. And uh, I think when you gather people of a like mind together, uh, they remember things that they didn't know the new and bring out all the things in each other that uh, are very new. And uh, it's okay. a great place. Those of us who have lived in this sort of worldwide folk community, for lack of a better uh, description, uh, we take for granted what an amazing community it is and, yeah. and the effect that it can have on someone who stumbles upon it. Uh, I know that's what happened to me. You know, I was a, a solo, you know, I just was, I love to play music and, but did it, there was no community in which to do it. And then when I discovered that, it was I, all of a sudden there were kindred spirits all around me, and uh, you know and that's how I met you. That's how many of us met each other at Common Ground. And yeah. by the way, um, this for those of you uh, watching this, listening to this concert, this was supposed to be uh, in real time in our Carroll Arts Center Theater with Tommy, uh, but the pandemic has done its work. But now here we are, and I think we'll probably even have more people viewing than uh, than if you were here in person. But as soon as this pandemic clears, we want you back over here. In fact, we'll probably come and kidnap you and bring you. <laughs> well, I'd love to. I'd love to come. And the, the whole, the, I remember Pete Seeger saying one time that uh, uh, he used to use, I wonder will modern technology save us before it destroys us? Yeah. And in a way, it's great that you can sing to people who want to hear you. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes you sing in a pub and sometimes people are there, but they don't want to listen. So they can go up to another room now and have a good chat there. So the, the only people, you know, watching and listening are people who are interested 
and uh, so that's special. I'll, although you have to sing in the odd wild place too. Well, that's right. Yeah, for the, for those of you folks who haven't been uh, over to Ireland and Scotland and England, um, they have these wonderful clubs, and they are in pubs, uh, which are rowdy and loud. But there's a back room where the listening happens, and yes. uh, it, it, they are just magic places. And and those people want to be there, even though they're not listening to everything. They want to be part of it somehow, you know. Yeah. Well, Tommy, it's been wonderful to have you here, and uh, I'm going to get out of the way so you can play more music for for folks. And uh, we wish you well and health there as this pandemic uh, does its work. But we will all be okay. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. And, and uh, I'm delighted to be get the opportunity to sing a few songs uh, for you all over there. Thank you so much, and maybe we'll see you in Ireland. Yes. Okay. Don't forget, don't forget to let me know. Take care. I will. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. I always will remember while the day we went away Sailed out of Belfast in the morning Our hopes were on tomorrow as we kissed the girls farewell But our dreams were on the day for returning And I'll be dancing, romancing And never more we'll roam There'll be rolling in the hay There'll be whiskey in the tea I suppose there is something magic about music, and uh, I remember been up with uh, Pete Seeger, a wonderful, wonderful man, no longer with us, as you know, but a big influence on so many people. Uh, that you, Fernand? Sorry, Dan. No problem. Yeah, uh, I'll, 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 good, good. And I'll, we'll be outside with the camera after a while, okay? Of course. Hey, Steve, so I'm going to for you. That's, that's Fernand. 
You may have seen him playing with me a few times. Actually, we played at Pete's birthday party in uh, in uh, New York. It's wonderful. My, my and my daughter and phenomenal. Maybe we'll have a song with the two of them in it before the end of the program because uh, I've got a few files that are dropping in here and there just to, uh, to break the monotony. But anyway, talking about Pete. I was up with Pete the first time I met him. I met up. Actually, it was Jim Musselman from Appleseed Records and uh, uh, Mark Moss from Sing Out who introduced me to Pete. And uh, I'd known him, of course, he had such a big influence in his own. But I went up and stayed with him all in the 1980s. But I remember, we were having breakfast together. And he said, does anybody know a song about toast? And he says, I don't actually know that you mention it. And he says, let's write one. Let's write one. So we started to write songs about everything. Everything. And we could run to talking about songs and we could talking about how sometimes music and song can help to break down barriers and heal wounds between people, not only between two tribes, but between even the conflicts in one's own head. And I said to Pete, you know, somebody should write a song about that. Pete says, you write it. I said, I did. And I come back up, I'm talking the Hudson River direction, and I call up to see Pete, and I sang the song, and he stood up all six foot, two and a half inches of himself. He looked out through the window of the Hudson below, and he said, it's good. But I could hear a butt coming. It's good. But it's too short. It needs another verse. He says, you write it. But he did. And we recorded this song together. Called the Music of Healing. Frighten the children, don't sing the songs about winning and losing. Sit down beside me, the green fields are hidden. Sing me the music of me. Sing me a song of a lover returning, darker than night, nearer the morning. Bring me the news of a new day that's stony. Sing me. Sometimes the truth's like a hair in the cornfield. You know that it's there. But you can't put your eyes on it. All you know is to follow its footprints. Sing me the music of the king. Who would have thought I could feel so contented? To learn I was wrong for all of my friends. I've learned to be high and I've learned how to tremble. Sing me the music. I know you're 
Let's sing it. Let's sing with me. Ah, the hearts of the stronger than the guns to run. Even when we're torn asunder, love will come to you. Ah, the hearts of the stronger than the guns of the run. Music of healing. Well, actually, that song has so many things that Peter's touched has carried on. Uh, it became the name for a, a seminar, an annual seminar it's called Music of Healing. Which takes place in this village of Rusfever oh, for the past 20 years or so. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, if you put music into a tense situation in the, in the right context, it breaks down barriers. And uh, it's based on the idea that uh, it could bring politicians and paramilitaries together who normally might be very much in disagreement or even shooting each other. Uh, into a situation where they could uh, find it less difficult to talk. And actually, I remember one time we were making an award to Pete Seeger, and uh, I invited along Jerry Adams from Sinn Féin, who is a big, uh, big fan of the music of Pete. And I knew that Pete would want a very wide embrace in the virtual presentation because Pete couldn't come over himself. Tal came over, his grandson. And uh, uh, so I decided to ask uh, one of the people from the P, uh, from the DUP uh, in Paisley's party, uh, who had been very, very much opposed to Sinn Féin. And uh, I asked uh, Michael Jeffrey Donson, Sir Jeffrey now, and uh, he said, I don't want to shake hands with Jerry Adams because two of his uncles have been shot by the IRA. And I I mentioned to Jerry Adams about this, and Jerry says, well, I understand his pain. I've got two bullets inside me from the loyalists side of things. But uh, Jeffrey Donson said a very interesting thing to me. He said, I'll go because you're a neighbor and that's a very important thing uh, maybe it's why we didn't go too far i mean it's terrible what happened here but all the parts of the world it's gone out of hand entirely but there was a sense of neighborliness we were neighbors children all of us and uh, it's only when people are separated by troubles and Going to ghettos, don't know each other, and it's anyway. Uh, yeah, I didn't ask them to shake hands, and the TV cameras there to see if they would. But I asked Tao to sing a song from his grandfather, and it was where have all flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls pick them up with one. When will we have a man? When will we have a man? After a while, they realized that both Jeffrey and Jerry were singing the song. It's so important to acknowledge pain, not only from your own side, but from all those who have been pained. And that's what that song does. Right. Well, I mentioned Fanon there, and uh, I'm, I'm going to play a little bit from Fanon and Maya and myself, and I think Bruce Foley. Uh, from upstate New York is playing with us in this clip. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, 
to just to preach uh, it. Long live Pete Seeger. And long live Toshi. I wonder, do you remember this song? On the hillside, little boxes, little ticky tacky little boxes, little boxes, little boxes, little boxes, all the same. And there's a green one, and a pink one, and a blue one, and a yellow one, and they're all made out of ticky tacky, and they all look just the same. And there's a green one, and a pink one, and a blue one, and a yellow one, and they're all made out of ticky tacky, and they all come out the same. And there's doctors, and there's lawyers, and there's business executives, and they're all made out of ticky tacky, and they all look just the same. And they all play on the golf course and drink their martinis dry, and they all have pretty children, and the children go to school, and the children go to summer camp, and then to the university, and they're all the and the boys go into business and marry and raise a family and boxes, little boxes, little boxes all the same. And there's a green one and a pink one and a red one and a yellow one and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. And they're all made out of ticky tacky. And the right on the wall And all the 
dreams you paint can be seen by one and all. I know your program begun and the future's just begun. We sow the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. You sow the seeds of freedom. In your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons, you sow the seed of freedom. In your daughters and your sons. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Wow, what, a, what an evening with Tommy Sands. And, uh, you know, you'll be able to revisit this on our YouTube site, uh, Common Ground on the Hill Official, as you can uh, revisit any number of wonderful programs that we have going on. But we invite you to share this information with other folks so that they can hear this message from Tommy Sands and uh, brighten up our day a bit. So, and again, hit that tip jar for Tommy and also... Uh, consider buying some of his recordings and uh, his, his writings. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to more with you.